Um, and we have articles posted at least every week, uh, many written by iconographers and other liturgical artisans. Um, so if you're interested in this topic, um, please have a look at orthodoxartsjournal.org. Um, and this is the first uh, symposium type event that the Orthodox Arts Journal um, has decided to organize. Um, so we're starting small, um, but again, if you're interested, please write down your interest and we'll let you know about future events. Um, I'm very excited to have these two iconographers in particular. Um, there's many iconographers in the world. Um, most of them don't speak English. Um, so that's one advantage we have here. <laughs> the, main, <laughs> the main advantage we have here is these are two iconographers who are very well immersed in the world of modern art. That is to say, the world of, of art out in the world. Um, and that's a little unusual for iconographers. Um, that means that they're capable of talking about iconography both in the language of the church's canons and liturgical traditions and in the language of art connoisseurship. Um, and that, that, that makes them very interesting speakers. And I think a lot of, a lot of insights may come out um, through their talks because of that. I decided to name this event Living Tradition because I think this is a particularly timely topic, not just in the field of iconography, um, but in, in our modern American culture in general. Um, here's what I mean by this. In the, in the era of decades past, let's say the 1930s to the 1970s, the modernist era, you might call it, there was a sense that anything old-fashioned, ornamental, in a historical style, was not a living tradition, but simply a, uh, a dead tradition. That is to say, if you were to build a new building that's ornamented and traditional, or paint a new painting that looks like a 19th century portrait, but that, that, that's just copying an antique style. It's not, it's not really art, it's alive. Well, this, this modernistic idea, fortunately, is finally fading away, and we're in the midst of a, of a revival of all sorts of traditions uh, surrounding us. Um, traditional architecture is coming back. Um, Old-fashioned ways of, uh, of, of American clothing are being revived. Look at the amazing revival of, of craft beer and whiskeys and so forth uh, in graphic art um, all over the place. You'll see old 19th century looking fonts and very decorative design on event posters and restaurant menus. Downtown, all of the, the, the newest, hippest restaurants have kind of a 19th century saloon theme to them. So there's a, there's a massive cultural revival, and this revival is saturated with the question of what makes a tradition alive. Um, just, just one small example, um, bourbon. You know, we like, we like bourbon here in the South. Well, what makes a traditional bourbon? People are obsessed with this question. Everybody's bourbon brand has labels, you know, with old-timey names and old-timey pictures, and people accuse them, well, you're just mass-producing it, and you put an old-timey label. Is that really traditional? So then there's other groups of people who are researching 19th century documents from distilleries trying to figure out how did they do it in the 19th century, because if we do it the same way now, then it's really traditional. Um, and is there room for progress? Is it possible to make bourbon that's better than it was in the 19th century, or is it no longer traditional if you do that? It's a very vexing question. I see articles about this almost every week in the newspaper just related to bourbon. Um, and and it's, it's the same in architecture. That, that's my own field, is architectural design. And this, this debate in downtown Charleston is huge because People want traditional buildings that look like Charleston buildings, but there's always a camp of architects who say, no, no, that's just copying, that's dead tradition, there's no way to make a new traditional building anymore, because this is modern times. There's other architects who say, that's, that's ridiculous. Buildings have always looked that way across many centuries, and we can take those ornamental features that make them look like Charleston buildings, we can design completely fresh new buildings that are really alive, that really reflect us in our age, they are completely traditional, but also of the time in a traditional way. Um, and that, that's, a, that's a real interesting argument that's been going on in architecture in recent years. I feel that iconography and the Orthodox Church in general has an opportunity to be a, a light unto the world in this, in this realm of thought. Because the Orthodox Church, her liturgy and in particular her iconography, has probably the most um, 
the exacting continuum of tradition over the longest era of time of, of anything you could find um, in, in European Western art. Um, iconography in the Orthodox Church has remained fundamentally similar in its appearance, in its canon, in its function um, for about 1,700 years now. Um, and it's been a wonderful process of, of continual revival. That is to say, in every century, iconographers looked at the best iconography from previous centuries, would revive what's best out of it, always adding something in new that's distinctive of, of their own country and their own time. And so iconography over the centuries, it's always the same, but it's always different. And that's what makes it a living tradition. It, there's a core of, of a canon to it that's unchangeable. That's what's theologically meaningful, the truth it reflects, and the liturgical functions it serves. And then there's something else about it that is changeable, the things that reflect the spirit of the age, the climate, the geography, the culture of whatever country, whatever century it came out of. Um, and, and the iconographers who are speaking us today, um, they, their work in particular exhibits this freshness, that you can look at their work and say, I recognize that that is new. That is something that was painted for us, for our time. It's not a copy of an antique. And yet, at the same time, it is entirely traditional. It completely conforms to the canon, what really matters, of all the iconography back to the beginning of the, of the church. Um, so, as I said, I think we can be a light, a light unto the world in showing the world that, yes, it's possible for a tradition to be alive, and it's possible for it to survive millennia, fundamentally intact, and yet still be as fresh now as it was at the very beginning. Um, and so, with that, I'd like to... Uh, introduce our first speaker, Philip Davidoff. Um, Philip comes from a, uh, a family um, of icon painting. His father um, is a very well icon painter, very well known icon painter in Russia. Um, I met him in Russia 10 years ago, um, Andre Davidoff. Um, and, and even 10 years ago and before that, he was painting in a very, a very interesting progressive style of iconography, not exactly following the strict Russian style of iconography that we think of from that part of the world, but bringing in influences from, from Romanesque, Western European medieval art, um, and from very early Christian, what you might call archaic or Roman Christian painting, um, bringing all these things together and painting very interesting, innovative traditional icons. And, and Philip Davidoff grew up in that milieu um, in Peskov in Russia, um, and he also has degrees in art. Um, from the, uh, the, the University of St. Petersburg, so he has the academic side of it and a living connection to a family tradition of painting, which is, which is very special because iconography had a big interruption in Russia during the Soviet era, and to have a second generation Russian iconographer is, is for that reason, a bit unusual. Um, so I look forward to hearing what he has to say. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Context is a very important thing. 
iconography as any other form of art should be working. It's not made to be decorating the wall. It's not made to be part of just church environment without special meaning. It has a special meaning. It does have to deal with very specific values, just as any other form of art deals with different kind of values. Well, of course, of course, we may find images of 8th century which would be as fresh or even more fresh than we can now afford. Or some images of 21st century, which probably, I don't know, may not appear some hundred years ago. Even if they would be able to make the animation, they probably wouldn't choose them to exist. Well, the question is that what do we want from contemporary iconography to, sorry, to be like? And what do we want it to work like because in our time, in one click of the mouse, we have accessible thousands of images. We have accessible all of the 2,000 years of the Christian history. And which of these periods should be the source for our inspiration? Which of the periods of this history deserves to be the best of the world, or deserves to be the only one? Or should it be any which we can call to be the best in the world? Well, I'm not just trying to make the short introduction because I do think that the iconography is one of the branches, a very important one, and I would say even the most important branch of the visual language, visual literacy of the humanity, but it starts very long ago. So it starts from so simple but so inspiring and intermediate things which we can't really imagine now to be part of iconography, but they are. They started working in the environment where they didn't have much of standardized spaces. So their spaces were all individually created and they had to deal with the walls. They are mostly decorating the walls because the panel painting was something too strange. And with the walls and architecture, we have to deal with the special concept of particular relationship between the image and the environment. How are they related? And we see the first example of how these things are being resolved in ancient Greek world where the amount of space dedicated to the image is in a very carefully selected balance compared to the rest of the space which is not dedicated to the image. Well, we can go to Greece and see the harmony of everything. We can try to come to them with our own measurements of beauty and we will fail because for these people they had very concrete understanding of what the beauty is. And after the Greece, with the harmony and beauty of the human being, we may see things like that and we come to Rome, where a harmony of the entire artwork is not so much important as important the individual face, the individual's features and documentary, I would say, approach to the image. So these all are predecessors of the iconography. These are roots, and we can't just go straight to Andrei Rublev without looking at these people. I don't know, but that's just something we can't avoid. So this is where the culture of iconography was born. They have already been doing serious things for hundreds of years, and we can't count on that. We can't count on Egyptian culture because we know that lots of influence of cult of death, of how life after the death may happen, the Christianity took from Egypt. And we do know these Fayum portraits, of course, which some of you may have seen in the museums. And I would ask you to pay particular attention to what the special goal of the artist might be in this concrete case. So, what is the idea of the master creating this portrait? What was his particular preference? Did he want to make this 
the person beautiful? Did he want to make him look rich or intelligent or, or what? So what particular qualities can we perceive in these images? And first of all, I don't like speaking about the images. I just try to be as technical as possible. But in some particular cases, I would say that when we try to describe this in our human terms, I would say we would speak about some grief dedicated to the understanding of human life which is ending and things going forward. So the grief we would see in these Fayum portraits is very special for them. But it's not special for iconography. So yes, we all know perfectly this culture which really was a rich one, but the time we can start about the icons, we are supposed to start speaking about something subterranean. We are talking about underground world or underground art, which also has to do with something with our underground art too. Because what they were doing wasn't an official thing. It was something private, private initiative to create a space for the dead, to create space for possible prayer near martyrs, near their dead. And the funny thing is that these white walls, these decorated walls actually are the walls of the subterranean caves. So they transformed these caves, which are not supposed to have any electric light, so dark and ugly caves, transformed into paradise. Paradise decorated with wonderful scenes from the Old Testament and New Testament. Well, most of our subjects, which we repeat now for 2,000 years, come from that place. These catacombs, well, many different catacombs in Rome contain images which can't be recognizable now and can be compared with what our time iconographers do. So the Abraham meeting three angels or Jesus, resurrection of Lazarus, and Moses receiving the commandments. Or let's go forward and see poor Egyptians, which are being same in the sea. So everything is already made 2,000 years ago. Why should we do something here? Why should we make any effort to pretend that we can do something special and you and three, three Hebrew boys in Farnas are supposing it the same as 2,000 years ago? So I would say the art of that time is not only helping us to understand what they did believe into, but how the art could work in a human environment. And what I want to admit, as speaking about Fayum, I was saying some words about the grief, now I would say this kind of art is not supposed to be made for beauty. I don't think they were really caring too much about decorating these images with lots of special particular kind of say. They weren't polishing them too much. They weren't make, trying to make them perfect. They just tried to tell us some wonderful and inspired story about their faith. And these wonderful inspired stories often are told with different symbols which we can learn when we start reading about the early Christian art. But my task is to say that this kind of art is not art in our understanding. This should probably be considered rather like something similar to an illustration to the Bible. Something reminding us of special events, but not trying to describe them completely. They don't pretend to make a documentary on the life of St. Paul. Or they don't pretend to show how the saints lived. They just created some particular space dedicated to peace, paradise and joy of their new faith. I would even say these images are childish, but the problem is that we can't repeat childish images. Because if your, I don't know, your neighbor's child will try to describe you something with his own or her own words, it will be a very special picture which will be faithful to reality, but you will not be able to repeat it without being not sincere. Because we can't repeat childish faith. It's something you can't do twice. So for these people, 
this simplicity of the language was the natural part of their faith. And the images reflected the way they were they were they were thinking about God and other sacred matters of their lives. When we start seeing first images in official Christian church, because we know that in 813, one Christian, the Christian Christianity became one of the official religions of Roman Empire. We also see the same sincerity in the images and intermediacy. We are not told that Christ would look beautiful. I would see strange figures with very strange garments which do not look sophisticated or beautiful or nicely painted. But they had some very particular intention doing that. Their intention was to tell us something important. And if you speak about the first churches they were building, they usually are ugly. As these first images are not much beautiful, the churches outside are ugly because that was the attitude of Christians and Christian artists. We are not supposed to work for the external beauty. We rather are meant to be working for the internal beauty. And approaching a building like that, San Vitale Ravenna, you think like, okay, what kind of, I don't know, warehouse it is. <laughs> but when you come inside, oh, sorry, you are surprised even with the little which is left, how wonderful the things are. And it's not coming to your mind how expensive they are, even if they were, but first of all, of how wonderful and still childish the understanding of the image for these people was. Because they were not trying to show Christ as a king or emperor or somebody who had power and somebody judging you right now. They were trying to share their joy, joy shared with the faith. And that's what we see first of all. I do see lots of efforts, yes, but I'm not paying attention to them just because of the main purpose of the painting is this joy. And if we go forward, we see other images like that in different cities, in different churches, sorry, churches, but everywhere we will see this simplistic approach and desire to transmit some important information and to share the joy. So they all are beautiful, they all are wonderful, yes, from point of view of our aesthetic understanding. But first of all, these are like childish hymns dedicated <coughs> to new faith, new understanding of what human life should be like. Some of them are Keep, uh, maintaining, preserving these qualities, even if we speak about a later time, mosaics or paintings. But my task was here to try to draw your attention to how, as I'm repeating Andrew's words, similar and different the images are at the same time. Yes, we see that they are mostly using very simple patterns. They're not pretending or not trying to be very realistic. At the same time, the approach to the image is very similar. The understanding of what the image should be toward our life in, a, in, in com compared to our life values is very similar to what we have. Well, this can be said, first of all, about the first icons and the first restaurants. Some of them are very realistic. I th I'm sure most of you have already seen this image hundreds of times. And yes, we are speaking about iconography, which reminds a lot kind of a portrait. Portrait of Christ. Portrait of Peter, Paul, or whoever else. And that was a very special time. Because in this very special time, art started developing, and lots of people not only wanted to see the images, but also created these images. And here we come to a very special situation, because images do exist now for a number of years. There are no official documents which the church make clear attitude to the, 
restore the image, so should it be used or not, anything like that. And we have lots of artists working for the church. But if we start talking about the first centuries after the official recognition of Christianity, we may also speak about lots of people converting to Christianity sincerely, but also converting to Christianity officially only. So, if you're an artist used to paint villas and wonderful landscapes and you have your daily bread, and here comes a moment when most of the city becomes Christian. And the Christian city would have different requirements now. They don't want any more landscapes. They want their walls to be decorated with images of the Mother of God and other. So, what should you do? If previously you were a special painter, and your specialty was to paint different kind of pagan gods and decorations of villas, what are you doing? You are just changing your official title, so now you are a faithful Christian, but not always it would be reflected in your daily work and in your understanding of the work. And the question is that I was talking to many of my colleagues and they agree completely that probably one of the reasons why in the history we can speak about the heresy of iconoclasm is because not all art was really the best art. And not every artist was really a faithful artist. So if we look at images like that, we say, look, this is the image of Christ. And if somebody would bring this wonderful thing to my church, and would say, look, I want this image to be in the very center of the liturgical space, I would say, you know, I probably would mind. Because I would not agree with this understanding of how Christ is represented on the image. Of course, it is something individual, each of us would imagine Christ in our own way, but the way this particular carver or whoever represents Christ is, for my humble opinion, is not something which we should use in a liturgical way. So, I'm thinking that maybe artists themselves created the situation when probably lots of people would say, look, instead of having an image of Christ like that, I would rather have no images. I would rather prefer not to have any particular hint visual hint of how Christ would look like, because I don't want any mistaken understanding of image of Christ. So, and after that time, we may speak about 2000, oh, 200 years of different iconoclast troubles, when people were killing each other for the concept of possibility or impossibility of using the images for the church, but it really was caused by many different uh, conditions including the one I have just quoted, I think. So we have churches, or there are word churches, which only used cross, nothing else, which now we can meet in some Protestant churches, which is also, probably, it's just a consequence of some bad use of images at certain time. So if you see somebody using some aspirin drugs in the wrong way, you probably will think of maybe not using them at all, rather than giving any risk of using them the wrong way. Well, after this time, when we have churches with no images at all, which are wonderful, but they have nothing to give to your eyes during the service, we come to the moment when the church council gathers again and again, and then make a decision that yes, the images can be used. But the problem is different now because since these people have survived or have been discussing the very special problems of the Conoclass period, they are thinking that images should not be tempting anymore, should not be understood as something portrait look like looking. And every single I would say mosaic or icon or fresco, which we have after iconoclast period, 
is not made the same way as it was before. The images in the church become much more abstracted, as we can say. Yes, they do remind us the human features. Yes, they do speak about the values we can notice in a human figure. But they never pretend to be as faithful to nature as the ones we had before the class period. So they do have lots of common things. But images of 12th century are uncomparably different by the form with the ones we had in the 6th century. So it's just a different world. Even if the content remains intact, we are no more speaking about portraits of Christ. We are starting to speak about a very special type of art, which not only in, con in its content is different from secular, but also in the form. And Christian artists <coughs> invent some very special tools, or I would say principles, which now most of people would like to, have, to call canons. So when I hear the word canon, I get frightened again, because it's so easy to say iconography is a special type of painting executed according to canons. My next question to this person is, can I read them somewhere? What are the canons are you talking about? Can you show me any source where I would be able to, to see what they are. I probably would also like to follow them if I would know which are them. And there are no actual canons. Yes, there are some certain and special principles in the world of iconography, but unfortunately there are no verbal things which should be written about images. And we only have very few indications from the church fathers how an image should look like. Well, I was pretty busy with this problem for a number of years, and at the end I came to the Seventh Nikean Council, and I read the Acts of the Seventh Nikean Council, which is confirming the possibility to use the images, and they have three different points regarding the images, three different practical things. First of them is dedicated to the miracles. So they describe some miracles which were which happened after some person entered this church and saw the image and prayed and there's this miracle, another miracle. That's not our responsibility. Another thing which they're talking about is the technical part. And I was so happy to read about it because there are so many different discussions among iconographers whether should we use acrylic or a temper, natural pigments or synthetic pigments. Should it be gesso? or something else, fresco, mosaic. So they say two different things, two phrases. First, shadows are the first friends of iconographers. Well, it means like, image starts with a drawing. And the second is, when the color comes, everything becomes much more beautiful. So that's their discussion on the technical point. <coughs> they don't say how you have to learn. They don't say how many colors are you supposed to use or pop. There are some colors, yes. But they don't tell you exactly how much egg you're supposed to add to your paint, or should it be big or small, and other things like that. That was the second matter. And the third matter the church fathers discuss, which I consider to be probably the most important, they remember, they speak about some particular images each, each of the fathers would know, in that church or this one, which are known for their particular power of impression. So they describe some people like, oh, there was such a sinful lady which entered that church, and when she saw that icon, her complete life was changed, and she started to lead another type of life. Or there was a special pirate who first was a pirate and a sinful man, but when he saw that particular fresco or mosaic, he is transfigured completely and he started to lead a different type of life. So I think this probably is the most important testament for iconographers that the image supposedly should be something influencing the beholder. 
the image should be something which is not only giving a possibility to feel nice or to admire how beautiful how beautiful the painted things are but it should be talking to you it should just be something which is calculated for you to be caught by or captured by and yes images are all different and sometimes with my students in St. Petersburg I discuss like would you be able to say which one is better because in previous one we would see much more human features and much more recognizable anatomical constructions than in this one but how it would be possible to judge whether there is any dependence on cooperation with anatomical rules or vice versa of making image more obstructed but more powerful so these are very special problems problems of how the image should look like to work to function and to change the world around it to change the beholder's life and I'm just showing different ones in order to refresh the memories, I know most of you may have seen most of these images many times, but just to refresh and to show how different, how great variety this Christian art history had during these 2,000 years. And this was actual for people of that time, and I'm sure it was working perfectly. Well, now of course we can download everything, but we have to think of what are we supposed to choose for our own work and how these things we have chosen have to work for our contemporaries. So would anyone be able to repeat this image without betraying it? I'm not sure. As, as I said, repeating a child's story about something, being an adult, you can't just do it. You can't just bring your own interpretation without influencing the story itself. Humans are not automats. And for this person, it was natural to have his particular understanding of beauty and how the sacred of subjects should be represented. But in Christian art, they are different. The standards from the beauty are different. For Leonardo, we can speak about the natural light, we can speak about different things which are about art. But here, the concept of beauty itself is different. I would say the faces are ugly. I would say the table doesn't look like a real one. But from the other point, we can try to understand what's the main part of the image. And we would immediately come to Christ, because it's the darkest and the most important figure. Then we would try to understand what's going on here and would also immediately get the idea of what's going on because it's easily recognizable. So what they were worrying about is to make the image readable, to make the image powerful, and beauty can be a secondary vehicle, but not the goal. Because sometimes icons are very strange. I would say I have never seen any human being with eyes to be so close to each other. Or I would never see a human being which would have such a very strange form of the skull. But from the other hand, again, we should try to understand what was the goal. And I think we will easily come to the conclusion that they didn't try to imitate nature or to show you the real haircut of St. Nicholas, they were just trying to bring your mind and eyes to the situation when you can concentrate in prayer and stay in a meditation without being distracted by any realistic feature. If, for example, here we have some very strange garments and very specific type of hand which is much smaller than the one which is supposedly good for this size figure all that is made on a purpose just to keep our eyes disciplined without being, being distracted to naturalistic part well, in late 
Russian centuries, we can speak about lots of Western influences, especially with time from time of Peter the Great, who wanted to introduce the Western painting into the Russian soil. And we have lots of icons which look very realistically. But the problem is, like, the beginning of the 20th century was a very special time. And by that moment, we can speak about iconography in a very strange way. The icons existed, but most of them were, were properly dark. Were almost as dark as this one, or even darker. So, we can speak about the revival of iconography in the end of 19th century or beginning of 20th century just because there were some people who started cleaning the icons up. And cleaning them up brought a very special situation. We can speak about this trinity because this was cleaned up in the 20th century. Well, do you see anything here? I do not. And that was the normal state of all icons which were painted in medieval time just because of some technical issues. At the end of the work, most iconographers used to seal these paintings with olive or linseed oil, which darkens with time. So you finished your work, you have sealed it, you brought it to the church, it looks nice, but after 20 years or 30 years, it darkens. So the parish priest or somebody else applies one more layer of the same linseed oil and it gets a little brighter but with 20 more years it darkens twice more. So at the end it may happen that you have a black board under these layers of varnish there might be something bright and wonderful but you will not see it. And I would say that we can speak about Rublev, but we cannot speak about the centuries between Rublev and us, because the Trinity used to be covered with varnish for years and centuries, and they didn't know it. They didn't actually, well, they had it, but they didn't know that what they had. And, well, this is 19th century icon, and even in these few years, it darkened so much. What we can say about things of 16th century. I wouldn't recognize anything in these dark outlines, and I would never believe there's something great behind if I wouldn't be a restorer. Well, I'm not, but anyhow. And the question is that revival of iconography, we have to say thank you to the scholars and scientists who started studying it, who started studying medieval art and trying to clean up what they had in churches. Because if you have a trinity like that, painted by Simon Pushakov, and even this was darker originally, but they have cleaned it up, but they tried to scratch a little bit the surface, and they come to a special situation when under the 17th or 18th century, they find the 14th. In many cases, restorers say that they have a kind of multi-layer pie, where you have 19th century, 17, 14, 12, something like that. So you have many icons in one. Just because they didn't want to make another board, they were painting on the top of it. And it happened many times that we really discovered lots of icons under some paintings made later time. So that was a, such a fascinating process, I believe, in the beginning of 20th century or end of 19th that lots of artists started to be inspired with the medieval art. We know about Vasnitsov or many other who really paid attention to what was made in Byzantine and other countries, and they were trying to introduce these values of medieval art to their own works. So in this, I think these are sketches probably, I'm not sure, the quality of photography is so bad, I'm so sorry. But I would say, at least in this one, you will see some particular qualities which are appropriate for medieval art. So local colors and no particular desire to create naturalistic space behind these paintings surface. So we can speak about revival of medieval principles. 
And after this sketch, we see the real George painted, and we do see lots of wonderful images created at that time, end of 19th century, beginning of 20th century. Well, this period of time used to be named like Art Nouveau or something like that. And we have some images in Russia of this time, but unfortunately we had the revolution. In all this, which could be a good going process, went left, lost. But okay, let's go forward and see some good things. This church was recently restored. It was built in 1913, Novodevich Monastery in Moscow. And this is one of examples of how these artists of that time started to work. They were taking medieval patterns and they were trying to transform them in a way that they would probably from a first glance look medieval, but when you start analyzing the form, how is it treated, how these forms are built, you will understand it's a new thing. It's not medieval anymore. The same church inside, and a very particular thing, it's actually a recently made photograph. There is some gilding on the top, some Riza or whatever, but the icons are dark. The icons are dark because that's how they imagined them to be in the beginning of the 20th century. They used to see them dark, and they made them dark. So the particular quantity of gold is just kind of compensation of darkness of the icons. Well, this is Patrick Cyril celebrating this in Georgia. You see, icons compared to real people are much more dark just because, I'm repeating, they were thinking they're supposed to be dark at that time. Oh, sorry. And paintings are made at this time. Yes, they are new because they were not trying to make something fast. This is the same church. Uh, this is short. Well, these are, yes, the Annunciation. Okay. Well, we can even speak about the situation when the state sponsored the development of Christian art. Because this man was a wonderful and a genius artist, I would say, and he created lots of different drawings and invented lots of different ideas for the use of the church. And they even had an enterprise, which is named Olova Nishnikov, something like that, and they produced lots of stuff for churches where they combined patterns from medieval time, early Christian time, and 19th century. Like here, we have a completely flat surface with some patterns and a realistically painted image of Christ. So this could never happen before because they were never trying to marry so different kinds of, so different qualities of images. And they invented new things. They were always using old patterns, but modifying them and trying to <coughs> use them in a new way. That's a method of many contemporary architects, I know, but not for iconographers. But let's go forward and see. So, typical iconoses they were projecting. Icons are dark, just because they used to see them dark. And after the time, yes, we know what happened. And we all know what was special situation afterwards, and what were the people who were doing it. So now we can only speak about the immigrants. So because most of our uh, iconographers or those who are trying to do something immigrate, <coughs> and we speak about Gregory Krug and a special man who built this triangular church. That's a very special project. It's somewhere not far from Paris. And it's really triangular because of the trinity, so it's all full of symbols. But for me it's important that because the frescoes were made by Grigory Krug. And I think it's probably one of the most important iconographers of the 20th century and most powerful man. Because first of all, we can say that he really followed the tradition. But from the other hand, we understand that he exploited new methods and you expressive means because nobody before would do things the way he was doing. Well, actually this church in the countryside, and they have very little money and they have very bad conditions, but before it gets destroyed, we can take these objections. 
And there is another Russian church in Paris, but it was previously kind of garage, which was transformed into a church. And there are many spaces like that. They're very simple, they are very authentic, and in their icons, they are trying to be traditional as much as they can. <coughs> but being contemporary humans, they cannot deny what they know. They cannot deny their own background, and they just try to make this background obey the tradition, but not cancel it completely. So the icons we have, or frescoes we have from their time and their society, are very special, because they do show the research for spirituality in contemporary world. The research for spirituality not only in its content, but possibility to find a way to express it in the form. And that's how we can value the works they make. We do understand how serious research was made, not to make some particular, I would say, professional way of making things, not to learn how to create a perfect icon, but to think of how the icon can be powerful, how can it work. And I would say every image we will see from Uspensky or Krug is different and I just will use the word working because that's what it is made for. He was not worrying much about the accuracy or trying to be very similar to the prototype because they didn't have books with colored illustrations. They didn't have possibility to use the internet to find out the models. They only had very narrow sources and what they could use, they tried to use modifying or transforming into something new which would be working for their circumstances. Well, this is the Trinity by Grigory Krug, and let's move on and let's see another lady. Oh no, that's it. That's it. Yeah, well, let's go forward. I just wanted to show you some different faces to demonstrate and to refresh in your memory maybe I'm sure some of you may have already seen it many times, of what were the main purposes of this artist, of this iconographer. What did he try to do? Because in every situation we may express ourselves in many different ways, and the way we express ourselves says about the intention. So what were the intentions of his person? I think these are most spiritual intentions we could find on earth. Well, that's another church which actually was the garage I'm showing with the light from the top. And again, we see some gold and most of the icons are dark. Behind the iconosis, there is a painting made by a special person whose name is Joanna Reitlinger. And part of her life she lived in Paris, part of her life she lived again in Russia. And that was another example of how a person who studied as a secular artist, try to modify her skills, her practical understanding of art, in a way to conform it to the iconography, to the requirements of iconography. And there are lots of her icons, but they're mostly very small, and we know that she mostly were, was making them for free as gifts to the parishioners of Father Alexander Main or other people like that. So that's one of the examples of how the art can serve the liturgy in the 20th century, but that's a rare case. Hmm. I think I have a part of the lecture repeating. I'm sorry. Just before the lecture, I was making some changes. Yes. So let's return to Russia, because we didn't have many churches in the world, but we still had some restorers who received lots of icons from these churches. And they started cleaning them up. And one of the people who was helping them, unfortunately this photograph is taken not in the young years, but in 1990s, no, yes, in 1990, Juliania Sokolova was something about 19, 18 years old, and she was helping restorers to restore the Trinity. Actually, I'm showing this picture as a funny thing, because even in the beginning of the 20th century, existed a possibility to take color photographs. There is a man, his name is uh, 
Oh, yeah, anyhow. And these beginning of the 20th century photographs will show us the Trinity. So here is the rule of Trinity, the way you would see it if you would enter the church. Would you see anything? Not much. And if you would even come closer, you would see something like that. Would you see anything? Not much. So the treasures of our predecessors were hidden under Risas, under the linseed oil, and other overpaintings. So this time, the beginning of the 20th century, was such a revival time, discovering such great treasures, that Giuliani, a young girl at that time, was under great influence. And that's one of her first icons, and I'm sure she painted it after participating in the process of revealing the Trinity. And I'm sure that being such a young girl, she was so impressed that this process itself has modified all her understanding of life. And she decided to dedicate her life to revival of the liturgical art in Russia. Well, at least she dedicated herself to liturgical art. She was making different kinds of sketches. She was trying to make researches because, again, no books. No color books, first of all. No photocopying machines, no internet, no hard drives. Nothing which would help anybody to draw or to paint an icon. So, step by step, she started gathering some material. She was part of different kinds of... Um, well, they were traveling to these remote churches to make some kind of copies. This was a really a research. And by the end of the World War II, they, started, they, they decided to reopen the Zagor's monastery, the Lavra, Troy's Sergei Lavra, and she was allowed to have a little circle of followers whom they were, she was trying to teach what the liturgical art should be. So she was using her sketches, which are just working sketches, nothing more than that, and she was doing her best explaining what, sorry, what the icon should look like, what the icon should work like. And we should really appreciate what she did in her time, which was impossible at the time, because nobody was doing anything like that. She was a unique person who has brought on her little shoulders such a, one, such a great task but here we also have to speak about a little issue which later became a great problem. Because when she started her work, she was part of the society of secular artists. She was educated secular artists, especially at the beginning of the 20th century. We know lots of special ideas <coughs> they had. We can speak about hobbies or other isms like that. And when she started teaching people in her little society, he kept saying the same phrase. He kept saying, an iconographer, if you want to be a real one, you have to kill an artist in yourself. Well, I later talked to some people who were her followers, and they were approving me that this phrase, which unfortunately is repeated many times in her memorials, in some very few texts she has left, this phrase, when she was saying that, would mean that iconographer would have to deny his own will in order to be a real and good instrument of the church. An iconographer should only use his skills for the church art the way it should be working and not pretend to know anything better than was created before. But the followers which were listening to her maybe were listening to carefully and they only followed her words and not her deeds. So what we see in her works, first of all, or not first of all, no, that's the wrong thing, but anyhow, if we start looking at the image, if we put it in the church, it would be visible from a very long distance. It would be visible in a very dark church and we can easily distinguish the figure. We would see that the figure is not just a pattern painted over some traced lines, but we would understand a great care 
and I would say respect, which the iconographer was showing toward the figure. She didn't have an array pattern at her head. She researched to create this figure, and that was an individual task. Every icon of hers is different, because even if the technical part may be very similar, she worked hard to make each of them special, to make each of them talk. And the sketches she was making, she only considered them to be kind of didactic material, helping her students to understand how the things are built, how the drawing should be created in order to explain. And she never meant them to be cartoons for painting, as also medieval drawings like that were never meant to be cartoons, to be copied and painted on the top, because they were just kind of Wikipedia reminding you of how, I don't know, San Trifon or San Mamant would look like. So these were helping tools. These were images made during the working process or as a research study to help the followers to understand how the form should be treated, <coughs> how the color should work, and so forth. But the problem is that out of these special schemes she created, the followers, and I would say generation of the followers, transformed into patterns which were supposed to be special tools for training perfection in drawing and painting. So comparing things which we have seen in mind by Julia Mia, I would say this is an absolutely perfect drawing process, but lacking anything human. And this lack of human brings very special results, because when training to draw and paint an icon becomes a special training for the technical part only, we only know how to make it technically. So students of our Institute of Theology of Sacred Arts, for example, dedicate lots of time on the first year cloning different kinds of motifs from the icons and creating this type of image, which is an icon without an icon. So <laughs> it's a motif from an icon, but it has nothing to do with it. And to say the truth, it would probably look more like a design of different kind of mountains or buildings or trees, rather like a real drawing or painting, which we may see. And as a result, in this school, which they founded after her name, after her, we see lots of large works, lots of icons, which are wonderfully executed from point of view of technique. So I'm not sure she did have any access to so much gold. Or I'm not sure she ever was thinking about making such a huge icon for such an amount of money as these people probably had. But the situation is different. So, if we start comparing what were her main values and the main values of her followers, I think we will really and clearly understand how different these, are, these worlds are. For her, I would say yes, she obeys the church fathers and she is trying to make the image work, to influence and to communicate with the beholder for prayer. The one on the other side, I would say it is good. It is nice, it demonstrates a lot of technical skills, but I'm not sure that behind the technical skills there is something more. In Russian there's a proverb like, you don't see the woods behind the trees. I don't know if it exists in English. Mm -hmm. Something similar. So they have lots of students, they have lots of different projects, lots of gold. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they are famous, they are great, they are considered to be the greatest school in Russia. But I would say that really there is some difference because her works are humble. They are not just humble, but they are trying to approach the sacred subject with a great respect. And those who go after her have access to every kind of image ever existed on the earth. I've been to their studio, each of them has a computer. Each of them has a special little working place, but with a computer attached to it. So it's 
it looks like a scientific lab with the only problem that the result which they have is totally different. So I'm not sure she was really worrying about denying an artist. She really denied some of her own will or her predecessors like uh, secular artist methods. But I'm sure, and I see, that this person did really deny any artistic skill or understanding what the image should work like. And recently I found this image of Christ, and I said, oh, Olga, come on here. I found a great iconographer of her time. Please come on here. And she said, hmm, yes, we probably should meet this person if he lives in Russia. Because it's not very often that instead of working technically, as we may see on that image, somebody tries to do some special work which is rather talking to the beholder or applying to the beholder rather than executing some certain steps. But after that, well, I was just reviewing a collection of newly imported images I allowed downloading into from my plans, and I clicked the space bar and I see the next one, and I say, oh no. I just say no because that is the way he was taught to work, or she. So, before this moment, this person worked the way he or she was feeling it has to be done. So, every effort was applied to make the image work and communicate with the beholder in order not to bother you with excess of information. So when we look at it, we first of all and only would see the eyes. Nothing around that would bother our attention and try to attract any attention of ours just because everything is secondary. But when we see the finished one, we see that every detail wants to become first. Every detail wants to be on the first place and to show how wonderful blue or how good gilding or how and so forth or how nice highlights they are. And, and it's lost. So it's a great problem, because iconography in money schools is taught in this way. You take the drawing, you apply the first wire, you apply the second and third, uh -huh. and at the end your guaranteed result, which has a certain number of highlights and shadows and other things, and you have a diploma which you are which would indicate you're a great iconographer or well, maybe a great professional one. And that's it. So I start crying when I see things like that, because it really may bring you a result like that. And actually I communicated with this man and I wrote him a letter. I found this maybe ten years ago, maybe more, and I wrote him a letter and said, You you know, that probably these sacred subjects are probably not the appropriate, I don't know, for, for the for mouse. And he said, you know what? You know who am I? I said, no. He said, I'm the seventh generation iconographer. And who are you to teach me how to paint? So, well, I did continue, of course, I, I, I tried, but I didn't come to anything. And I remember that he actually couldn't be seventh generation iconographer because those villages who before revolution were producing icons in dozens, in some time were transformed into black boxes industries and mostly were making the decorative patterns, decorative motifs. So he says, Seventh generation, yes, maybe he had some predecessors who were making icons and some who were making black boxes, and then he started again to make some sacred subjects. But what well, I'm talking about technique, and technique may bring you to this kind of result, unfortunately, sometimes. Well, yes. But if we look at what our predecessors were doing, or at what people were inspired by in the beginning of 20th century, end of 19th century. And what is so special about iconography? What makes the icon to be so special? I would say it's such a deep lake. It's a sea, it's an enormous ocean 
which is really hard to understand. And the problem is that if we try to interpret this deep sea in the world with our vision, which we can see from our own point of view, it may become a kind of comic representation of what the original image was meant for. Or I would say, if probably some toy producer would decide to create a toy with Mona Lisa's face. So for me, this comes to the concept of a similar understanding, because in this case, I would find more than 100 different words to indicate the depth, the power, the spirituality of the content of the image. In this case, I would just say, it is nice. <laughs> It is sweet. It, I wouldn't say it's beautiful, but I would just say these two words, nice and sweet. And it many of, in many cases, it really happens when iconographers who are taught the technical skills, who are taught how to execute their work, start making, start doing their job, and do what they're supposed to do. The problem is that they probably were never <coughs> taught to look. They were never taught to think of what makes the image work. They see, okay, I see the green here, I see the yellow, the, the orangish, and I probably don't have this yellow substitute to something else, and the hair it may have been this way. Good, okay, I'll do it. Well, I can tell you, yeah. Uh, some years ago, I happened to be in <coughs> Finland. They have an Orthodox seminary in Joensu, and they have a church maybe really a little smaller than yours, which was painted by some Greek iconographer. And it was actually painted on canvas, and they imported it from Greece and blew it up on the walls. But while I was there at the service, Again, I started crying, I'm usually not much crying, but <laughs> that time I was, because I saw, unfortunately I don't have the photographs, I think it's probably destiny, I don't have them, that the man who was painting images, it's a different one, but just to negate something, I would say, I had an impression that if you would ask him, who for you would be Archangel Gabriel? He would say, Archangel Gabriel, he is 15 brush strokes. That's it. And who for you would be St. John Chrysostom? Hmm. 85 gen. Russia. Done. So what I saw in this church was a very brief execution of certain technical thing, because technically you can draw very quickly, very slowly, you can draw with different kinds of moods. But what I saw there is that understanding of the image is not about who is painted, but about what about how you're supposed to perform it. The way you perform your activity as an iconographer is the most important thing. Um, I don't know. Well, I have a friend who is a theologian, and I think if you would ask him who is a kind of Gabriel for him, he would spend hours describing he would say a thousand different words, which will be not very brave, which will be humble and respectful, and very slow words, because he wouldn't know how Archangel Gabriel would look like or how should we describe him in 15 brush strokes. So that's what I think one of the most important troubles of our time. Otherwise, we may have another situation. Like this is a beautiful icon which you may see in Washington. DC. And here is a version of contemporary iconographer who trying to be creative. So we do see that the throne, which didn't look well, he was substituting something else. And he also substituted the garment because it didn't look good enough. Dirty maybe. And he also substituted the color of the garment of Christ and changed it completely. And now my question is, if you would compare these two images, 
what do you say the red looks nice here or not? What do you say red looks nice? Sure. Sure. Okay. What about the yellow and the blue? What about this combination? It's interesting. They, they work together in contemporary terms when you think of so if you speak about power, maybe we should not use the word nice. Yes. So I think in this case, he was thinking of how to make this image powerful. And that one was thinking of how to make this look nice. Even trying to be creative, in the creation process we have choices. And the choices we make are very important because they reveal our intentions. Artists cannot lie because if in text you can copy and paste, here, whatever you do with your hand, you just do and everybody will see it. If you didn't sleep enough, but you're working okay, it will be maybe visible, maybe not, but it's important what result you have. And the intentions which you have are all clear. In other case, we have an image, we have a church painted in 1913 in St. Petersburg. It's a part of it. And some of the images <coughs> were very damaged. And we had a team of local restorers who started to do their work. So what happens if you're trying to do something good, you may have probably the best intention in the world, but you don't really know how technical things are done. Because this man or woman was not only a skillful artist who knew how to do things and not only a spiritual person, he was both at once. So he knew how to create a spiritual image and applied all his efforts to make it. So he knew visual literacy which would allow him to achieve this result. And this was trying to do his best with whatever he had and whatever exist, uh, experience he had, and you see what you see. Well, I probably should stop on saying some negative things, and I like saying some more positive things because I'm rather about positive. And uh, I'm introducing some contemporary iconographers whose works I think to be good and whose, I would say, efforts are probably have good directions. That's what I think to be the most important thing. Because the work we all are doing is limited by our possibilities, but is not limited by our intentions. So we may have wonderful intentions, but not be able to realize them. Or we may wish just to realize something beautifully without having any special intention. And that's probably the main issue about the economic. So, we can mention some people who do images like that, who used to take patterns from books and execute them the way everybody is working. But this man, I occasionally found his work, and I know where he is, not only makes traditional images, but sometimes, from time to time, he also tries to paint something that is special, very strange, where I would say amount of work is uncomparable. Yeah, so we can we can speak about, I don't know, hours, days, or maybe weeks to complete this one. And this could technically have been done in half an hour, I don't know, whatever. But I want to bring you the images which would show the desire of their authors not only to fulfill the task and then to get money and go home, <coughs> but to create something which would be talking to the contemporaries. And this man, I think, has achieved some certain result in this work and another one. There is another person who was born, I think, in 1948. He's not very famous, but we're trying to do everything we can for him to get famous. And not only this man, brings together the contemporary understanding of form with these birds and other things, but trying to melt together the traditional elements, the traditional understanding of how concentrated or disciplined the image should be, together with the 
decorative moments which are no more decorative for him. So we have trees, we have lots of different things, but the way he coordinates all these wonderful instruments and his orchestra keeps the main value work first. So first of all, our attention is directed to the face and the eyes, and now the rest is just a secondary help to keep our mind and view in concentrated state. And some of his work, well, this is the same one, I just love showing it. Yes. Baron. And I'm sure we may notice lots of traditional understanding of the form, but the way it is used, the way it is combined, I think is just very thoughtful. He had lots of time to think before move, moving around all these objects, all these details, and putting together all these elements. And there's another couple. Arena is painting icons, and Sergei is the man who is making carving. So he's wood carving. So this is hers. And that's a church. They actually have been making the interior iconostasis for eight years. They have almost finished it, but there are some issues. But anyhow, I just want to show you different photographs. Unfortunately, the space is very narrow, so it's, the church is larger is rather large than long, so we can't take the picture of the entire agnosis. And I want to draw your attention how on the first glance you will see, yes, I have seen something similar to that. I may have seen something in the museum which would remind me that exactly. But when you start looking at it, you will understand with so much with how much discipline and understanding this technical part is executed. So yes, we do have some gold, but the gold is not distracting our attention from the face, it remains a secondary thing. We do have some color, even bright one, but the brightness of the color is not trying to pull the blanket. We only see well-balanced and properly working images just because they were made this way. And the frescoes on the top are really so pale as you see them here. So they are made as not to compete with the icons and to keep the <coughs> understanding of the space light enough. She tried to keep the situation in this church not overwhelmed by the imagery. That's why she has chosen some almost quiet background <coughs> to keep it really light. That's some Romanian master, whose only one work I have. I don't know why I'm showing it, but I just wanted to say that even if you would decide to deny every kind of artistic rules, you can only work the eyes even without the rules. So the problem is that most of our contemporaries have learned some technical rules, but they're not thinking of what these rules are supposed to apply for. This is a Serbian man, I'm not sure if it's his full name, but I have seen some of his images, and I'm going to show them. Lots of things would remind us traditional work, but some of them would still tell us that something new, something maybe too fresh for the traditional understanding. And this man was a teacher of another Serbian ethnographer, whom I'm going to show now. So I don't say through all these images I'm going to show you and I will show you now, I'm not trying to say these are the best in the world, these are the most acquired or the most skillful. No. I'm just trying to show some effort, some researchers to make the iconography live in our time, in our space. And this man's name is Todor Mitrovic. And he lives in Serbia. Well, some of his items are very small, some are bigger. And he was also educated as a secular artist. Well, a couple of years ago he had an exhibition of 83 items like that. And now I'm sure it's all that. He tries to make iconography respected, not only from the church, because he does have some church fathers who respect his work, but also from the world of contemporary art. 
and the exhibition he had, he had it in a contemporary art gallery, and it really had some good success. So that, that he thinks his task is to try to bring iconography, become an actual art, uh, working a very powerful art. He doesn't say again he found recipe and he can guarantee the success, but he's trying to find a way to make iconography become contemporary, to make it work. Well, some of them I think are really great, especially this one dedicated to Saul or Paul, by the way, to Damascus. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Or he also has, yeah, well, this one is debating in St. Petersburg while we invited him into the symposium. And he actually is printed one book and going to publish another one as part of his PhD. He has made one drawing, he has made the photocopies of it, 42. 42 photocopies, and each of them developed in different ways. So if you were an ethnographer, you probably would have some school where they would teach you, okay, only this color you're supposed to use forever for your faces, or only that color, no. So he tried to break this pattern, well, in book, unfortunately, they included only 17. But generally speaking, he developed 42 faces out of the same drawing. And that's, yes, that's more of his words. He just somehow loves the Egyptians and Israeli escaping from Egypt. And that's one of his latest ones. I was criticizing him for, because this is maybe too sharp. Or if at least he would put maybe two of them, two more, that probably would be working better. Again, I'm not saying that these images should be in every church. And they should not. But anyhow, the iconographer should be like, should try to be, well, this one we actually have to own. It's probably four times smaller size. And they must be working in a way that the icons should not be considered as traffic signs. Oh, this is Vladimir Sky. I've seen it. Okay. Oh, this is John the Baptist of this time. I know him. So icons are art. Icons are the way to communicate and not just the patterns we're supposed to perceive for a second. Two years ago in Moscow, we had an exhibition where they invited iconographers as well as some secular artists trying to deal with some secular subjects. It was a very interesting experiment, especially because nobody was trying to scandalize or to show off. There was kind of cooperation. So iconographers learned how new could be the things, and the secular artists were trying also to cooperate in form of the space and the sense of liturgical context. So these are this is my work, all this work, and we'll go forward. And now I'm showing only our works, because I really thought we are limited in time, and I was afraid we may not have enough time. Um, some of them were part of the exhibition two years ago, some of them were not. Uh, different. Again, I the best compliment I heard from someone who is a scholar and art critic, this person said, hmm, I like your works and I see you can do better. So that's the best thing I have. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Because the main issue we think is that you learn technical procedure and you keep continu continuing to do things the way you were taught without really thinking how different things could be. So this was like four years ago, my word? No, maybe more. And this is something like two years ago. I'm not really sure even this is supposed to be an icon or not. Actually, the name of the exhibition in Moscow was Gifts for the Christmas. And they, they, they called me and said, look, we have exhibition gifts for Christmas. What What do you think? What do you make? I said, mm, okay, they're carrying some gifts for Christmas. So it's an image, which was also an experiment. And this icon started a kind of series of different images dedicated to the humility of Christ. 
especially related to some particular events going on in Russian Orthodox Church, Moscow Patriarchate, like about three years ago. And well, there are different ones, and I do really hope that main quality is that they are different, and we keep staying fresh. Well, she's not here with us, but she's working now. I am <laughs> working and that's shooting now. And some of all the work. And really the main thing is that the Christian art of 21st century has to be moving forward, has to be fresh, and has to discover new possibilities. Not denying all what had happened before, because this technique is a really a jest when people say, oh, you invented it. No, no. It was 12th century, very well diffused technique, which we just reintroduced, and any other colleagues are using it now. But many things are just to be brought back with a fresh understanding. Gold, oh, wonderful, but you should, should be aware of how much gold you need. Because recently, last two years, we were almost using no gold. And I'm sure the images we were making with all gold are not worse than the ones which we had with gold. So this is really just again, and this probably is the actual size of the, yes. So, the, fortunately, we had in our biography the possibility to study in fine art academy, and we do have some workshops. So teaching workshops give us the possibility to be independent from the clients. And sometimes we have, thanks God, sometimes when we have no orders and we can dedicate the time to research, to the experiments and to thinking of how the item may work in this circumstances or that circumstances. And that's really a great blessing. Blessing to be free, blessing to try to find out new ways. Okay. This one was recently purchased by Virginia Theological Seminary in Washington, D.C. And actually they invited us to make an exhibition in their seminary, Anglican Seminary, for October. So after a while, I hope we'll establish the dates before we bring some more images there. Yeah, these are the details. So, Probably, in some cases, would simplify some things too much, but that's made in order just to break the pattern of recognition, just to remind us that the Annunciation, first of all, is not a set of details. It's a particular historical event. It's a part of the sacred history of the Church. And we should percept it in a fresh way and not look for patterns in the past instead of and yeah, that's the other, trying to hang it. And that's the one she has made a couple of days ago because we have some commission for Cambridge, the Our Lady of Walsingham. So she was thinking about that now. And they have different Christmases because it's totally like Egyptians. She likes Christmas. And this one I thought of Christmas because it has its Isaiah. And the three magi coming to the mother daughter to bring the gifts. And this is the one you may see in the church here, and that was actually a great temptation or a great challenge, right? Because the gold is such a powerful thing, and it's so easy to make the gold make the main work, not leaving anything to the painting part. So she said, I've spent like two weeks or more just for thinking process and sketches of how to make these two parts cooperate, the painted part and the gilded part. Because, well, no, the back. In gilding, it not only is rich, but it's also so strong and expressive that it is overwhelming. And to complete with the goal, you cannot make the image too equal to it. So that was the reason why the face was made so dark. Looking to the face, you just have to switch completely in a different direction to percept it and not to think about gold anymore. So that's why the face is made so strong. Here gilding, well, this was many years ago. Here gilding also exists, but 
voltage is faded enough not to bother. For different things, different curves, each of them I can just try much time, but I'm sure that the most important is not of how many efforts you apply, but how really you wish your talk to be obedient to the tradition and not talking for yourself, like, oh, look, that's my new version of image of Christ. No. The problem is that our predecessors were never cloning their images because they used to have different circumstances. Like for this church, this iconosis, you have different proportions than for another church. In this case, you have lots of gold. In this case, you don't have enough means for the gold, and you have some other icons in the neighborhood which have no gold, so why should you use it? <coughs> Obeying to the circumstances is a wonderful thing which makes you create. Every new circumstances bring you some new situation and make you think in a new way. And that's a great freedom. That was actually also an Anglican church in New Jersey. And that was 10 years ago. And I'm really proud of how I made it not to be too strong. I made it to be well blended in the architecture and not requiring too much attention. So the best compliment I heard from the parishioners, it looks like it is always here. It looks like it's been here for forever. And here is the other project I'm having now in front of me when I'm going home. That's it, Chabot. Or when I started thinking, it looked like that. And now it looks like that. Uh, <laughs> it's a very little space, and they want only the outer area to be decorated. So maybe kind of, sorry, um, sketch, which may be demonstrating. So it's not a big thing, but the main issue, again, is to make it work, but not to be too strong, not to pretend to be too strong in order to give you a peace, peace for prayer. Because icon is a tool which is supposed to be an instrument for prayer. It should not be trying to tell you how to pray. It should just give you a possibility to stay in front of God and to pray. And that's why we think we have to make so much efforts to learn how to do it, to continue researches, to find how to make a better peace. Thank you for that. Well, thank you very much, Philip. That was a fascinating lecture. How wonderful to be given a history lesson from the very beginning all well, the way, to, all long, the, all the way through to things being painted last week. Um, <laughs> <laughs> very, very, and, and, on the topic of tradition, I, I very much enjoyed how you, how you illustrated the the fragility of tradition by illustrating some some of the cases where it can it can fall too far in one direction or the other. The 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 sort of decadent extremes of the Art Nouveau period in Russia versus the opposite extreme of sort of stifled academic convention that is very that is very commonly seen among icons painted in in Russia and Greece nowadays. Uh, and finally, finally showing us these, these especially innovative iconographers who are pushing that boundary, you know, sometimes pushing it too far, but with the intent of uh, helping us to understand what, what painting really looks like when, it's, when it becomes alive again and free. Um, and and I, I really appreciate that. Uh, we'll, take a, we'll take a break now. We have a lot of time scheduled at the end for questions and answers, so I think we'll just put that off until then. And we have refreshments here. And um, let me let me make please. one announcement. You all stand while I'm making the announcement, if you like. Uh, we're we're going to ask the blessing on the food, and then let me encourage you and invite you to enjoy our courtyard and gardens. It's a beautiful day to enjoy your food and drink there. Please don't take any food or drink into the church, however. The bathroom. There's one here. There's a door on both sides. Lock both doors if you go in there. You might be surprised. There's also a bathroom on the other side of the narthex 
as well. Okay? In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thou hast ascended in glory, O Christ our God, granting joy to thy disciples by the promise of the Holy Spirit. The blessing they worship, that thou art the Son of God, the Redeemer of the world. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. Lord, have mercy, Lord, have mercy, Lord, have mercy. Service for thy holy, always, now, and ever, and unto the ages of ages. Amen. Uh, evidently, I'm from Puerto Rico originally. Uh, that's why I'm Spanish. Uh, and uh, I moved to the United States when I was 11 years old. And I had no contact with art really until I met two young men uh, when I was in junior high school uh, who were involved with graffiti. And so through seeing their drawings, I very quickly, I got hooked. I, want, I said, uh, you got to teach me how to do this. And so they started teaching me the process of, of, of drawing in the graffiti style. And eventually one of them introduced me to the works of Raphael and then Michelangelo. And then a whole world started to open up to me uh, that I wanted, be, I wanted to become part of. And so eventually, in high school, it, it became clear that I wanted to go to art school. And um, so um, it wasn't until I was in my last uh, year of undergrad, if I'm remembering it correctly, that I uh, became orthodox. Uh, actually, I, I discovered orthodoxy, and then in, in uh, my first year of uh, my graduate program at Hunter College for painting, uh, then I became orthodox. Uh, I mean, um, I, I, yeah, I was, uh, was received into the church. Um, and at the same time, there was a struggle about all right, what I want, what, what do I want to do with my life? Uh, do I want to become a uh, monastic? Do I get married? And what about painting career? And so one thing leads to another, and I end up in the monastery, and that's where I picked up icon painting. I basically transferred all the knowledge that I had acquired through my painting education to iconography. And so it became a process basically of discovering what we have been dis discussing today. Uh, the fact that um, icon painting at first appears to be very straightforward and simple because all you have to do is copy something else, but ultimately you realize, well, that's really not what it's about. Uh, one of my first icons, if not my first icon, was say, an exact replica of a uh, Palik icon. Uh, Palik was a village in Russia that specialized in the production of icons. And um, I, I, I basically did everything according to the rules and according to the canons, right? But you could very easily see that it was dead. It didn't have anything that I put in there. It, it wasn't an experience of the prototype within myself that, that then I expressed in conformity with tradition. So what I'm going to do today, it's going to be a, a little bit more of a, of a rigid approach in that I'm going to uh, go about it and, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read the talk, but uh, meanwhile, I'm, I'm going to have more um, text for you to look at to help you uh, grasp some of the concepts than images. And I'm glad that uh, Philip uh, provided, you, provided you with so many images because it gives you a really good background for you to then uh, relate what I will be discussing uh, and put, uh, uh, put into context. So I'm going to start with two, uh, by the way, you can easily see here that the talk is called Imagination, Expression, and Icon. 
reclaiming the internal prototype. <clears throat> and I'm going to start with a couple of quotations. One by Jose Fountain, who, for those who don't know who he is, he's a Greek uh, master of iconography from the late 19th, early 20th century. He went to Paris. He had a career as an illustrator. He was a great novelist and writer. Uh, it, throughout his career, he was highly acclaimed uh, in, in Greece, but he, he's uh, one, along with uh, Ospensky and, and crew, uh, Philip mentioned them, who, who collaborated, these three people and others, in reviving the icon in the 20th century. So his work, along with Ospensky's uh, meaning of icons, which book you'll find on the table, uh, are very important for us in the 21st century, and they became they were instrumental in the 20th century to really help us uh, understand what it is that we have to do in order to retap to the tradition, what it means to paint a traditional icon. Um, and so, Fotis uh, Kantiglou wrote the text called the Orthodox Tradition. Oh, actually, the, the text is, is, is called The Orthodox Tradition of Iconography, put together by Cavarno. It's an edition that gathers some of the uh, work, <coughs> the written work of, of, of Conteglou. And in there, uh, he states, Each one of us has his own peculiar way of expression. The capable artist is by no means a mechanical copier, but a creator in the true sense of the term. Unfortunately, even among iconographers, there are some who have the idea that iconography is an art of copying. Such artists, by saying this, reveal quite clearly that they have understood nothing with regard to this art, and that they are incapable of probing its mystical depth, but occupy themselves only with the surface. Okay. That sets up the problem. Well, this is the one. One word, forgive my interruption. Sure. The first church that Photius Contigo planted in North America is the Holy Trinity Greek Orthodox Church in Charleston, South Carolina. Wow. So if you all didn't know that, or if you're in town only for the weekend, you should also be sure to go to Holy Trinity where you can see his first works in North America. Thank you very much, Father, because I, I had no clue that's possible. Like um, uh, the next quotation I'm going to give you is by St. John Honstadt. Uh, I'm not working here. Maybe it'll work. It's probably not. Sometimes it depends on the position because your steel, yes. Should be. No? Does it have to be on top of a little board? Perhaps. No? Oh, yes. It looks like it's showing something. Click it once to the left. <coughs> yes? Good. Yeah. There we go. Great. Okay. Icons are a requirement of our nature. <clears throat> Can our nature do without an image? Can we recall to mind an absent person without representing or imagining him to ourselves? Has not God himself given us the capacity of representation and imagination? Icons are the church's answer to a crying necessity of our nature. The point being made here by St. John of Kronstadt is of crucial importance if we want to avoid some misconceptions surrounding the icon. We often hear that the icon has nothing to do with the imagination, which is generally taken to be the untrustworthy playground of demons. The negative diagnosis is a commonplace in ascetic writings on pure prayer, as can be found in the classic text on orthodox as a Catholic spirituality, the Philokalia. However, St. John in this passage appears to run counter to the norm. While on the one hand the ascetic tradition speaks of the imagination as detrimental and deceptive, on the other hand, St. John sees it as a gift from God. So is there a contradiction here? Not at all. St. John does not contradict the ascetic tradition surrounding the ambiguities of the imagination, but rather augments and complements it. 
thereby helping us arrive at a more nuanced understanding. He is definitely not to be interpreted as encouraging the cultivation of imaginative fantasies as a method of prayer, something that often leads to delusion. Rather, he gives us the other side of the coin. Instead of focusing on the dangers surrounding the misuse of the imagination, he points out its indispensable, edifying, and profitable side, its undeniable link to the icon. The two are inseparable. The one presupposes the other, since the imaginative faculty involves nothing other than mental images, mental icons, if you will. Hence, to deprecate one is to deprecate the other. He finds the imagination, he finds in the imagination, a defense for the icon. But St. John is not alone. He, in fact, follows very closely St. Theodore de Studa, who says, quote, Imagination is one of the powers of the soul. It is itself a kind of image, as both are depictions. The image, therefore, that resembles the imagination cannot be useless. If imagination were useless, it would be an, utter, an utterly futile part of human nature. But then the other powers of the soul would also be useless. The senses, memory, intellect, and reason. Thus, a recent and sober consideration of human nature shows how nonsensical it is to despise the image and the imagination. So what I want to emphasize and focus on from the outset is not the complexity surrounding the methods of prayer, but rather the fact that we should be cautious not to cart away the imagination as something completely useless and evil based on our misunderstanding and misapplication of hesychastic writings. Indeed, we are not to cultivate fantasies during prayer. However, as St. John and St. Theodore imply, and as we will see in other fathers, uh, as a God-given faculty, the imagination, the imagination has a positive dimension. It can be used properly and play a profitable role in other areas, in particular craftsmanship. We can then say that the imagination, as a receptacle of images and sensations, is a neutral faculty of the soul, bordering between the senses and the higher faculty, the noose. It serves a mediating function which makes it ambiguous, as if having two faces or sides. It can look up towards the intelligible light of divine truth, and become luminous, or it can look down towards the enticement of the senses in hedonism and become darkened. In its receptivity to impressions, it resembles soft and pliable wax. It can also be compared to a mirror. So what is it reflecting? How is it being impressed, inscribed, and directed? It can be steered by the purified news, inspired by the Holy Spirit, or by the passions, manipulated by demons. In short, it can lead us to delusion or aid us in our ascent towards deification, theosis, our participation in the divine nature, as St. Peter puts it in his epistle. So today I want to approach things from a slightly different angle. Yes, the icon is unquestionably an affirmation of, of the incarnation, sacramental object. It can be described as a support of contemplation or prayer, a vehicle of teaching, a window into heaven, theology in color, etc. Yes, this is all true and good and not to be undermined. But I have specifically chosen these two statements by St. John and Canterbury since they remind us of what tends to go unnoticed, bypassed, or ignored when discussing the icon. Its creative act, which inevitably involves expression and imagination. This, I'm sure, sounds uh, dangerous to those of us who have been repeatedly told that the icon is not to be confused with art. 
which amounts to saying that it has nothing to do with vain and solipsistic self-expression or dubious imaginative inventions, latter being disparaged as nothing more than reckless and irrational fantasy, perhaps in the mind of some best exemplified by the Gothic nightmares of Hieronymus Bosch. But then again, some might recall with apprehension the elevation of the imagination above reason in Romanticism. Others of his connection to the lugubrious subconscious in Surrealism. And still others will blame, who will blame it for all the aberrations we see today in contemporary art. But, needless to say, this is not the imaginative context we have in mind. Rather, when we speak of the imaginative act, we mean the mental imaging process that precedes any making or manufacturing. Well, I got the wrong one. It is what you want to see. <laughs> <coughs> we articulate within ourselves an idea or form as a mental image before we express it create the word or bring it to actuality. Using Aristotle's four causes terminology, we can then call this idea the formal cause in contrast to the final cause, that is, the end or purpose towards which he, the work is directed. The craftsman himself and his tools to which the work is realized being the efficient cause. The raw material to be shaped by the imagined idea, the material cause. Therefore, in this process of craftsmanship, the imagination, the imagination plays a crucial and inevitable role. Hence, the need for us to understand its valuable and positive connection to iconography. But, it should be stressed that what the iconographer imagines or recalls to mind <coughs> uh, as St. John puts it, are not his own illusory inventions, but rather revealed truth, real deified persons, and sacred events, as noetically known within ecclesial life. In other words, the content of his formal cause is not his own, but the resplendence of orthodox doctrine and tradition. The imagination is to reflect these as on a polished bronze mirror. However, no two mirrors are the same. Inevitably, the reflection of each, depending on polish and nuances of surface quality, will have peculiar characteristics. Hence, from this positive use of the imagination just described, arises what Contiglou calls a peculiar way of expression, an indispensable feature of the authentic icon. I believe that looking at this often undermined side of the creative act can help us avoid the approach that makes of iconography mere slavish repetition, the superficial and mechanical copy of old works and nothing more. This tendency is often accompanied by a simplistic notion of what it means to adhere to tradition and fear of artistic license. Contiglou's statement about the superficial approach to iconography is a problem that will always be a challenge to face in the practice of any traditional sacred art. How then are we to overcome this tendency? Okay, the alternative that I would like to propose today is an approach to icon painting that reclaims the positive use of the imagination, in which the prototype is engaged not merely as an external sketch, but also as a mental image to contemplate with the eye of the heart and interpret as it is being painted. The highest ideal in the application of this process to be seen in the iconographer who does not rely on external sketches at all, but works directly from his heart. It seems clear to me that the diversity of styles in the history of icon painting, as Philip was showing, attest to this fact, this, uh, this act of reimagining, in which personal and cultural temperaments are not stifled, but rather flourish in freedom, as they express the ecclesial experience in unique, in unique ways.
ways, yet in full harmony and conformity with tradition. Okay, before we explore the creative act in order to supply context uh, to what will follow, uh, I think it would be important to clarify what we mean by terms uh, such as news, art, and tradition. We can by, the, uh, by way of the icon's distinctive aesthetic, without a doubt, the icon through its unique pictorial language unveils an inner vision. It represents a way of seeing not merely according to the senses, but rather with the eye of the heart, what the fathers called the noose, in Latin, intellectus, and not to get confused with what we think of as intellect nowadays, intellectual work, uh, it's perhaps better to think of it as the spiritual intellect, rather than just pure ratiocination. Although the noose is higher than discursive reason, uh, Dainoia in Greek, the fathers at times group these together when designating man as logikos or rational. The noose, as we read in the Philokalia, is to be understood as, quote, the highest faculty of man, through which, provided it is purified, he knows God or the inner principles of created things by means of direct apprehension or spiritual perception. This direct apprehension or intuition is seen in the Spirit according to the Holy Spirit, above abstract concepts, subjectivism, passions, and fantasy. It encompasses a wide spectrum from the loftiest forms of prophetic vision to the more immediate knowledge of God through the beauty of creation. The pictorial principles of iconography is traditional formal language, often called the canon, arise from this inner vision, which from here on we will refer to as noetic intuition. As we have noted, <clears throat> it is often said that the icon is not to be confused with art, a statement that needs clarification since, ironically, although used to defend its cause, it ends up belittling its creative import and demands. On the one hand, we would have to say that this statement is only partly true if we mean by this that the icon is not gallery art. That is, the icon is not an autonomous art object, art for art's sake, an end in itself, an individualistic statement. But on the other hand, it is a very specific kind of art, like Philip was pointing out. That is, liturgical art. And as such, a major component in the total work of art of church cult, or worship, ritual, the divine liturgy, in which various arts participate to create a harmoniously integrated whole contributing towards the deification of man. Moreover, the icon is obviously an art in the traditional sense of the word techne. In Latin, ars, from which we derive the word art, meaning craftsmanship, the skillful joining together of parts according to a right course of reason, or logos, as Aristotle puts it in the Nicomachean Ethics. Hence, art is to be understood as the principle of manufacture, applied to a specific purpose or end, and remains in the artist as knowledge. According to this understanding, there is no stark difference between so-called fine art and crafts, beauty and function, or meaning and utility, as we have it today. As Elder Emilianos tells us, quote, for the ancients and for scripture, no distinction was made between art and artifacts, or technology, which if they corresponded to the needs of our nature, could hardly be foreign or hostile to beauty. In a traditional integrated society such as the Middle Ages, under the category of art fell um, uh, anything from painting, sculpture, <coughs> calligraphy, masonry, architecture, farming, to music, poetry, rhetoric, philosophy, teaching, ruling, etc. 
So it is important to realize that this traditional doctrine of art, which is still to be found in the Orthodox Church, although we might not realize it, has been the norm from time immemorial. Our modern conception of fine art being the anomaly in the history of civilization. It could be said that liturgical art is in fact the highest realization of the function of art. That is, the act of joining together since it serves to reconnect us to God himself. Hence, it is the culmination of art's incarnational import, its capacity to unite heaven and earth. We can then begin to see how, within this context, iconography is not to be seen as requiring less creative engagement than our contemporary notions of fine art demands, as some might think, rather in being more complete and having a higher purpose, it indeed demands the most out of us, requiring the mastery of pictorial principles, manufacturing skill, intellectual rigor, theological knowledge, the coming together of creativity and spiritual discipline, functional and symbolic values. All of this unfolds in accordance to tradition. And here is where it gets pretty interesting. <laughs> but, what, but what do we mean by tradition? All right? We all seem to have an innate understanding of what that means. And I'm sure we have in the wedding knowledge of what it is, although it would be hard to put into words, so we'll, we'll give it a try. Um, so, by tradition we do not mean the legalistic use of ossified canonical forms, mere conventional conservatism, <coughs> nor antiquarianism. We rather mean the ever new and ever renewing life of the Holy Spirit in the Church through which we come to the knowledge of the mystery of the Word incarnate. Or, as described by the English painter Cecil Collins, it is, quote, that continuum of knowledge which deals with the meaning and purpose of man's life and with the possibility of his rebirth. It is a knowledge ever new, fresh, immortal, always present, not subject to time. In short, it is nothing other than the revelation, with a big R, the pre-eternal counsel that has been made manifest and still continues with us today in this deifying efficacy. Yes, tradition is immutable and living expressed in a multiplicity of forms, whether it be words, images, architectural arrangements, sounds, gestures, rites, etc., all of which do not exhaust the unfathomable depths of tradition. <coughs> These remain unalterable insofar as they continue to function as adequate conveyors or symbols of truth. The Church, then, has the liberty, through the power of the Holy Spirit, to alter these according to pastoral necessity. The forms arise, but do not stand above tradition. For as Lofsky puts it, tradition is, quote, the unique mode of receiving the truth. We say specifically unique mode and not uniform mode, for tradition in its pure notion, there belongs nothing formal. It does not impose on human consciousness formal guarantees of the truth of faith, but gives access to the discovery of their inner evidence. But this, of course, does not, ex ex uh, does not, uh, is not an excuse to dismiss and dismantle all formal expressions of tradition arbitrarily, as if we have to update things according to external criteria. On revisionist, based on revisionist historicism, progressivist or modernist notions. Far from it. On the contrary, it is a caution against the kind of formalism that tends to mistake the surface for the content. 
the latter for the spirit of tradition. Both extremes, whether it be willful innovation, cynicism, or hardening formalism, are to be avoided. Be that as it may, when it comes to the icon, there is no doubt that in the course of history, tradition has been expressed in a variety of styles reflecting personal and cultural temperaments, as iconographers have creatively confronted and resolved immediate needs. These also reflect different levels of spiritual maturity, noetic intuition, and artistic mastery. Hence, tradition cannot be trapped into just one approach or mode of expression. No style or school of iconography can claim monopoly to the most authentic formula, although it might be firmly grounded on what can be called the timeless pictorial principles of iconography. It should be kept in mind that these principles are not purely static, but rather extremely flexible and expandable. They are, they are not the tradition itself, but that which makes up its glorious garment, the efficient grammar and letters of a language giving clear expression and manifesting the unfathomable depths of tradition. And like all languages, they go through organic changes. The pictorial principles derive their timelessness and accuracy insofar as they participate in immutable tradition. From this participation, they become the unifying components in the diversity of pictorial dialects or styles. The styles can perhaps be called the unique rather than the uniform modes of embodying and expressing the noetic intuition of truth imparted by tradition. In short, there is room for dynamic creativity in cooperation with the Holy Spirit. Obedience to tradition does not stifle or deaden, but rather paradoxically transforms, revitalizes, purifies, and resurrects persons and cultures to the fullness of their unique capabilities. With this understanding of tradition in place, we can now return to the question of the imagination and the unique modes of expression. Let us start with a passage by St. Gregory Palamas, who says that, quote, this imaginative faculty of the soul is an intermediary between the intellect, which in the translation is, they use, they use the word intellect for noose, the intellect and the senses. For the intellect beholds and dwells upon the images received in itself from the senses, and it formulates various kinds of thought by means of distinctions, analysis, and inference. This happens in various ways, impassionately or dispassionately, or in a state of between the two, both with and without error. From this thought, are born most virtues and vices, as well as opinions, whether right or wrong. When the intellect enthrones itself on the soul's imaginative faculty, and thereby becomes associated with the senses, it engenders a composite form of knowledge. He then adds that uh, the various kinds of knowledge we attain in this way pertains not only to natural science, but to every method and art, that is, technique, or craftsmanship, as defined previously. By the way, the passage is from the fourth volume of the Philokali, which I recommend you take a look at, in St. Gregory Palamas, uh, his uh, chapters on natural science and theology. Now, so as we can see, uh, as stated in the beginning and confirmed by St. Gregory, the imagination is a neutral faculty, instrumental in the acquisition of knowledge and serves an indispensable demiurgic function in craftsmanship. Through it we shape, synthesize, clarify, conceptualize mental images, thereby embodying our ideas before they are given external expression whether in the form of buildings, sculptures, vessels, vestments, icons, etc. While we are on this earth clothed in garments of skins or suffering from the consequences of the fall, 
suffering for mortality, having to supply for our physical and spiritual needs by means of manufacture and symbolic articulations, the imagination will always serve this indispensable function. In this process, as St. Gregory notes, the intellect, or noose, the soul's governing faculty, is to enthrone itself on the imagination, thereby stabilizing and directing its use as a tool according to the right course of reason, as we referred to earlier uh, when speaking about technique. As Elder Sophroni explains, echoing St. Gregory, quote, we see a third aspect of the power of the imagination when a man uses this faculty, his faculties of memory and imagination to think out the solution to some technical problem. And when he has done so, his mind will seek means for the practical realization of his idea. This activity of the reason in association with the imagination plays a vital part in human culture and is essential for the economy of life. We can also perhaps think of the imagination as a tablet or parchment unto which the news sketches, alters, erases, and redraws mental images according to a spiritual illumination, ideas, and knowledge of principles. Hence, the craftsman's process of mental imaging can be said to correspond analogically to the act of creation by the logos. Uh, by the way, these are different, uh, uh, basically, variations of the, on, on a theme that be, uh, betrays the fact that tradition doesn't mean the ossification of forms. Um, that you might want to look at for a moment until I get to the next one. So, as I was saying, the craftsman's process of mental imaging can said to be to correspond analogically to the act of creation by the logos, meaning the Son of God, the Word of God, second person of the Trinity. Just as man has a form or idea in his mind before he imprints it on formless matter, so likewise there are recent principles, uh, recent principles, logi, words, invisible models or imageless images in the logos of God before these are expressed, that is, manifested, given concrete hypostatic existence in creation from formless earth, as we read in Genesis. Therefore, some have even called the logos the divine reason for whom all things were made, the art of the Father. Man, created in the image of God, in his creative act, imitates the divine craftsman. <clears throat> St. John of Damascus points to this traditional analogy when comparing the invisible models, or <clears throat> paradigmata in Greek, archetypes or prototypes of God, to the plans and prescriptions an architect has in mind before he sets out to build. And Andrew probably knows this better than anybody else. He says, there are also in God images and models of his acts yet to come, those things which are his for all eternity, which is always changeless. Blessed Dionysius, who has great knowledge of divine things, says that these images and models were marked on beforehand, for in his will God has prepared all things that are yet to happen, making them unalterable before they come to pass. And this is the important part here to emphasize. Just as a man who wishes to build a house would first write out the plan according to its prescriptions. Implicit in this statement is the fact that the architect does not write the plan before he has first beheld a mental image, paradigma, of it in his imagination. This is also taken for granted by St. Nicholas Cavasilas who speaks of, the craftsman's, uh, uh, speaks of the craftsman gazing noetically within his soul at the exemplars, models, or mental images he is to follow in executing his work. He says, 
It is the practice of painters to depict according to an exemplar, in that they produce their art from preliminary sketches, even when they use their memory to such things and look to the soul for a model. Painters only. But one may see it in the case of sculptors, architects, and indeed all craftsmen. Were it possible to see that artificer's soul with the eye, one would see the original house or statue or other work apart from the material. We should notice that St. Nicholas speaks of exemplars and models as both external and internal to the craftsman. The first is designated by the sketch, the second by the mental image recollected by memory. A recollection which, of course, as St. John of Kronstadt shows, unfolds imaginatively. St. Theodore de Studat also echoes St. Nicholas when he says in reference to the icon, quote, we are taught to draw not only what comes into our perception by touch and sight, but also what is comprehended by mental contemplation. I believe that the best example of an iconographer's freedom in solely relying on the, contem on the contemplation or imaginative recollection of the internal prototype is to be found in the renowned account written by Epiphany the Wise in fifth, uh, 1415 of Theophanes the Greek at work. He, does. Here he, goes. He's he says about Theophanes the Greek, while he delineated and painted all these things, no one ever saw him looking at models as some of our painters do, who, being filled with doubt, constantly bend over them, casting their eyes hither and thither. And instead of painting with colors, they gaze at the models as often as they need to. He, however, seemed to be painting with his hands while his feet moved without rest. His tongue conversed with visitors. His mind dwelled on something lofty and wise, and his rational eyes contemplated that beauty which is rational. This, of course, is the highest ideal, and not all will attain to it. Nevertheless, it is one worth keeping in mind and, uh, and aspiring towards by the contemporary iconographer. So the question remains. Is the external or internal prototype determining our icons? Undoubtedly both. It couldn't be otherwise for most of us. But perhaps without much awareness of the imaginative act or mental contemplation. It seems to me that the general tendency is to think of icon painting mainly in terms of the external sketch and we have virtually forgotten the inner model the imagined prototype. As Contiglou says, we tend to occupy ourselves only with the surface. We tend to undermine what was taken for granted by the traditional craftsman, the positive, crucial, and unavoidable role of the imagination in the creative act. Therefore, we fail to consciously direct it and accrue the efficacious results in iconography. But here, I believe, is where we find freedom from the mechanical copy Conte Blue warns us about. The process of reimagining the prototype is free, insofar as it is not servile to mechanically reproducing the surface of the external sketch, but intuitively apprehends its spiritual content, interprets and represents it in a new and living way. The interpretation will inevitably vary from painter to painter, since each individual's mental image of a given prototype will always be slightly different when solving specific pictorial problems. This is unavoidable, for as we are all unique, uh, for for we are all unique individuals, living within unique cultures and a specific historical moment. The painter can even revalorize pictorial elements from his immediate or foreign cultures when these are found useful and adequate in conveying the content of tradition. The icon will inevitably reflect 
yet need not be overwhelmed by the nuances arising from these contingent factors. Undoubtedly, the essential and unalterable elements of the given subject are to remain, but the subtleties of color, line, composition, etc. will vary from person to person and place to place. If in conformity to tradition, they will be at once time-specific and timeless, showing both individual temperament and spiritual objectivity. All right, uh, the reason why I'm showing you this is because the account about uh, Theophan the Greek appears to be so far removed from anything possible that somehow, you know, you can't point at a specific person and say, oh, he could do that, you know? But uh, the, one of the painters that I could think of that does have that capacity is George Cordes. He painted the church uh, Holy Trinity in uh, Colombia. Uh, and uh, he's done many churches in the United States, and his process of work is just what you're seeing. He's not looking at a sketch. He has uh, made the prototypes his own, and he has memorized them. And so he goes to the space, and the space basically, in, in a way, determines what he's going to be doing, because given the specific strictures of what you're working with, then uh, it, it, it points you to the right direction in terms of scale, proportion, so on and so forth. And so that's him at work. And this is one of his sketches. As you see, you know, there, there's erasures that go on, and so it's pretty fluid. Okay. And these are, that's one of his, uh, one of his recent icons of uh, St. Paul's uh, vision, road to Damascus. A very peculiar icon, but very powerful. Um, and that's one, the dormition that he did. And um, the reason why I'm showing you this two in particular will become more explicit as I'll show you the other ones. Uh, that sets the beginning for a variation of the theme of the Dormition in other icons. I'm see these Russian icons. This is from Fora in Constantinople. I see it. Different, you know, additions, more or less details, depending on what needs to be expressed, what iconographer wanted to see at that moment about the reality of the event. And here are two other ones, and pick that one at the end is because it's very abstract, you know. And so when you go back to Cordes' work, then it doesn't seem so strange. Uh, it does it does have abstract quality, but nevertheless, uh, it's simple conformity to tradition. Sometimes we get so used to seeing a specific kind of image that we forget that in medieval times, iconographers were doing very abstract things and very, what we would consider to be mannered kind of work, uh, very cartoonish and sometimes garish. But they were doing it and it's traditional work. And so uh, we get into aesthetic habits, so to speak. Now, for some, uh, there remains the fear of artistic license, I'm sure. But not to worry, we're not advancing in cautious and unrestrained subjectivism. A blurring of the edges between iconography and gallery art. Ironically, the 20th century revival of the icon has instilled in some of us the notion that tradition is the ossification of artistic forms, rather than reawakening an awareness of its living, ever-renewing power. Safeguarding the canon has led to a morbid fear of innovation making it difficult to access tradition today in a fresh way. It is often said, icons are not art, but objects of prayer. Although true at face value, this kind of rhetorical trope in fact bears the seed of misunderstanding. Perhaps it can be seen as 
and an oversimplification of the thought of the pioneers of the icon revival, who, in an attempt to deliver the icon from Western dominance, disparaged art since the Renaissance as distorted products of the imagination. Be that as it may, this kind of statement, as mentioned in the beginning, instead of safeguarding the icon, ends up undermining and stifling its creative import and fresh possibilities. It presupposes that since it is not the fine art of an ivory tower individualist, anyone can paint an icon. There is no need to, for previous artistic training, knowledge of pictorial principles or imagination. But is this not a denial of the icon as technique? In an attempt to liberate the icon, we end up shackling it by lowering the standards of its craftsmanship. The specter of fine art in the end wins, since we have not replaced it with an awareness and understanding of the traditional or normal doctrine of art. What we rather should be stressing is that the icon is, in fact, a clear example of the realization of the highest capacity of art. As we have said, demanding of us the highest level of knowledge and skill. This is one of the negative sides of today's rampant popularity of the icon. In an attempt to make it accessible to everyone, we unwittingly end up promulgating mediocrity, imitation, and mechanical copying, wherein the iconographer is expected to suppress his intellectual, creative, and interpretive engagement. The human component is undermined. With, the, with this attitude, it matters little whether the icon is hand-painted or mechanically reproduced by thousands. In the end, depersonalization replaces the presence of the author, or the author's experience, or expression of his experience of the prototypes. Ironically, the icon, a witness to the unique personality, oh, sorry, Uh, the icon, ironically, a witness to the unique personality of the saints, those who have actualized their calling to the education in a particularized and unrepeatable manner, becomes a mechanistic exercise that stifles the unique mode of expression of the iconography. But this, of course, is not to promulgate the modernist cult of individualism or so-called artistic genius. On the contrary, let us remember, life in Christ presupposes the flourishing of our true and unique personality, that is, conformity to our true nature or logos, as St. Maximus the Confessor would put it, in, co in contradistinction to our egocentric or individualistic identity. Therefore, the traditional practice of not signing the icon should not be interpreted as an aspiration towards the complete obliteration of the iconographer's creative temperament. It is rather a reminder that only in humble cooperation with the divine craftsman, in becoming one with him, will his true self and art flourish to the fullness of their capacity. Thereby, he will be able to uncover nuances containing the prototypes previously unnoticed and contribute unrepeatable expressions of tradition. <clears throat> in undermining this side of the icon, seeking to protect it from artistic license and foreign cultural influences, we may in fact <clears throat> blunt its power, making of it a purely mechanical act that contradicts basic principles of orthodoxy. How then is the iconographer to avoid the mistake of taking freedom for license? Only when he has made the tradition his lifeblood and experienced it from within, as ever renewing power, as accessible today as it ever has been. Only when he has begun to discern and made the timeless pictorial principles of the icon his own. But how is he to avoid arbitrary innovation? Not by hesitation, but only by taking risks. 
only when he has, as we have said, encountered the prototypes, not as sketches observed external to himself, but as the heavenly realities or spiritual realities, saint or saints, he is communing with in the chamber of his heart, apprehending with his noetic eyes. Only when the logos, the dogmatic content which determined the composition of the subject is known from the inside out in such a way that it touches him, imprints him with its unique presence and begins to guide the creative act. This is what we mean by interpreting the and reimagining according to truth and ecclesiastic reality rather than fantasy. In other words, as uh, Philip Sherrard says in uh, an essay called The Icon, if I'm not mistaken, uh, in, which is part of uh, his book uh, called The Sacred in Life and Art, he says, in other words, there is here no distinction between art and contemplation. The artist must raise his vision from earthly to divine concerns and perceptions until he can mentally entertain the form which he is to imitate, until this form lives within him with his own inherent vitality. There has to be an endless renewal and repetition of the internal imaginative act, an endless recreation within the life of the artist of the spiritual realities which are the subject of his work and which must spontaneously inform his work if it is to live. In such a process, although the iconographer will not seek self-expression for his own sake, his creative te temperament will not be quenched, but rather give, given freedom in the spirit. For where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And as we have said, put in another way, by the historian, historian of medieval art, Ananda Kumaraswamy, quote, this is inevitable, only because nothing can be known or done except in accordance with the mode of the knower. So the man himself, as he is in himself, appears in the style and handling, and can be recognized accordingly. Only when we paint from our experience and knowledge, arising from living communion with the subject depicted, rather than from the experience of others, whether they be from the 15th 